Alright, so we're back again we're with another case study. I really like doing these. It, it seems like you guys like them too. They're, they're really fun. They're enjoyable. I think it's going to help us because I think the goal of doing these like weekly will continue to keep adding to our understanding of how to effectively diagnose particular conditions and manage multiple conditions simultaneously. It's going to be a lot of repetition week in, week out. So by the time we're done with all of these like tons and tons of cases, you guys are going to be experts. That's the goal, right? All right, engineers. Well, let's get started here on case study three. I'm really excited. I think this one is a lot harder <laughs> than the one we did last week. A lot of you guys are so awesome and so dang smart. You guys picked up the condition like immediately. And that is really, really cool. So we'll go ahead and try to make this one a little bit more difficult. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, first things first, definitely need you guys to understand that the cases that we are talking about here are fictitious. They are not real. They're referenced and created um, by Ninja Nerd, okay? And they're meant for educational purposes only. It's not meant to diagnose or treat medical conditions. It's just to help aid you in your medical development, okay, and educational development. So important thing to remember there. All right, so let's get started here. Ready? We got a 50-year-old male comes to the emergency department unresponsive after being found down at home by the girlfriend. Last time the girlfriend saw the patient was approximately 12 hours ago. EMS stated that when they entered and arrived on scene, the patient was found on the floor covered in vomit and completely unresponsive. So that's about all we have about their HPI, them coming into the ED. So right away, what can we kind of summate from this? We have a 50 year old male, unresponsive, down for potentially unknown time, maybe 12 hours, covered in vomit. Okay, so let's go on to the next part here. So that's what we got from our subjective. If we continue on with our subjective, what do we know about this guy's past medical history? It's pertinent for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, okay, COPD. He's also a type one diabetic. He has cirrhosis in chronic hepatitis B infection. No pertinent social uh, surgical history, uh, but his social history that we were able to gather from the girlfriend um, and some chart review was tobacco use. Um, he's a pretty regular uh, smoker and he also denies any like illicit drug use per the girlfriend, but he is a daily alcohol drinker, drinks a lot of like um, beer and liquor. Allergies, no particular known drug allergies or food allergies per chart review and per the girlfriend. And the medications that he does take for his underlying conditions is he takes insulin, um, 18 units of Lantus. Um, he takes that once a day and then six units of Humalog um, TID with his meals. Okay, and that can adjust based upon your carb coverage. But either way, um, that's that. And he also takes albuterol and ipratropium inhalers, uh, PRN for his COPD. All right, so that is what we got so far. So, so far we can summate that we have a 12 hours ago, he was found down, unresponsive, with covered in vomit. That's what we know at this point. Okay, start thinking about what could be going on uh, and what you, know, you wanna start potentially doing. All right, but let's move on. So we got our subjective covered. The next big thing is we're gonna move right into the objective component. So the patient is brought into one of the emergency room. Uh, uh, one's a little bit diminished. The right one's really brisk. On the motor exam, we have to apply some really painful stimuli to his nail beds. And we notice that he is localizing. So when you squeeze here, he's trying to go after the hand. So he's localizing with the right upper extremity. When you apply painful stimulus over here, he's kind of extending that left upper extremity. And when you apply painful stimulus on his legs, he's triple flexing those bilateral lowers, which is really bad. When we listen to his heart, he is tachycardic. He's got a regular rhythm, but you hear a murmur that's at that left lower sternal border and near the apex. Sounds a little flunky there, okay? Maybe like a potentially like a kind of like a holosystolic murmur. You listen to his lungs. Since he was covered in vomit, maybe he suspects an aspiration. Uh, you hear some ronkerous breath sounds, really, really heavy in that left lung, and you hear wheezing bilaterally on auscultation. 
you palpate his abdomen. It's relatively soft, except for like in the right upper quadrant near his right costal margin. It's a little firm, you kind of feel. Um, but he's got normal active bowel sounds. He's got no guarding or rigidity uh, present there. And then you take a look at his skin. And when you look at his skin, you see these like little hemorrhagic or petechial lesions on the palms of his hand. Um, and even you see some track marks on his bilateral upper extremities too. So to quickly summate what we got with this guy, we got a 50 year old male, past medical history, COPD, type one diabetes, uh, cirrhosis, chronic hepatitis infection, okay? He's a tobacco user, alcohol user, maybe drug user based upon these track marks that we visualize. He was found unresponsive, potentially found down for maybe up to 12 hours. He is hypotensive, tachycardic, tachypnic, hypoxic, and febrile. He's got a significantly scary and, and catastrophic neuro exam. He's got a murmur. He's got ronchorous breath sounds in that left lung. He's got a firm right upper quadrant pal like upon palpation. And he's got these petechial lesions on the palms of his hand. This guy's really, really sick. Okay. But start thinking about what in the heck is going on with this guy. There's so much. Your differential is probably like massive at this point. But let's take it one step at a time, guys. We got this. So next thing, I want you guys to take a second. Take a second and think about what labs you want to fire off. Think about just the most important labs. Now, I have particular labs that I thought was the most significant, but you should list and even put down in the chats what you think is an important lab because it might be something that somebody else didn't think about. So put down some labs that you guys would want to check on this person. So we got people saying glucose, BMPs, blood glucose, some electrolytes, CBC, ABG, some troponins. Okay, LFTs, tropes, ALT, AST, drug profile, a lot of stuff. All right, cool. You guys are really thinking about these and some of these are really, really great. I love them. All right, you guys ready? So this is what I ordered. And again, don't, just because this is what I ordered doesn't mean that you guys can't order it. You guys might see something that I didn't pick up. Okay, so this is what I have. So we got a CBC on this guy. He's definitely febrile, right? And he's hypotensive. So I'm worried about sepsis. Okay, so he's got that SERS criteria, right? So I check a CBC because I want to check his white count. And also sepsis can really lower your platelets too. So I saw someone in there put platelets. That's a good thing. He wasn't thrombocytopenic, uh, but that's another thing to be thinking about. Also, are they anemic as well? Are they in shock because of hypovolemia? So good things, I think that's a good test to get CBC. The pertinent finding for him was that he had a crazy high white count at 35 and he had a left shift with some bands, uh, cells that are greater than 10%. I got a CMP, he has cirrhosis, okay? I wanna see what his LFTs are. Maybe he has an acute on chronic liver failure potentially. So I wanted to check that. Plus with a CMP, I get my BMP as well. So I wanna know what the heck's going on with his, um, his kidney function. I wanna know, does he have an AKI? Cause you can get AKIs um, along with electrolyte abnormalities present with uh, sepsis if he is septic. Um, and then we also get some um, from this, you can see here he's got transaminitis. He's got increased ALT, AST. He's got an elevated ALK FOS. He's also got a elevated BUN at 40 and a creatinine of 2.4. Now, maybe this is his baseline creatinine. We don't know. And maybe he just doesn't go to the doctor enough to say what is actual if he has CKD or not. But we were able to find a baseline creatinine from about a year ago, and it was 1.1. So that's about all we have to go off of. So this is definitely 1.1 to 2.4. Yikes, that's at least a two time difference from his normal baseline that we have on record there. So maybe an AKI, but think about that. And he's got some hypokalemias, potassium was 2.8. Usually that's you know less than 3.5 is abnormal. So, so far that's what I got there. I checked a coax. Again, the reason why is, if he's got really bad liver failure, sometimes with severe liver failure, what do you guys not produce? Coagulation proteins, right? So you don't produce like factor two, seven, nine, ten, protein C and protein S. And so that can maybe cause a coagulopathy that could potentially cause a bleed. So I want to think about that as well. Okay. Oh, someone, so someone put a question here. Now, just with the info, I have, I'm thinking overdose with underlying. Read, uh, so uh, Jenna Pertrucha. It says, now just with the info I have, I'm thinking overdose with underlying sepsis that lead to shock, possibly from bacteremia or infective endocarditis. Could be, could be, we'll see, maybe. All right, so good good, good thought there. 
So coags, I got that, they came back elevated, particularly the INR, it was 2.1. You want it to be less than 1.7. Um, so in this patient, it, it was a little bit elevated. So that's also important to think about. A urine drug screen, I wanted to do it because I saw track marks. He was febrile. He's a pretty decent tobacco and alcohol user. Why not just make sure, do a urine drug screen? Did come back positive for heroin, okay, and alcohol. Point of care glucose, he's a diabetic. I, I want to check it. I want to see if his glucoses are high as well. So it came back at 280. Urinalysis. I want it to, again, if I think sepsis or there's a infe in potential infection, i got to find the source. So a CBC can help us out with that, a urinalysis and other things as well. So urinalysis was done. It was normal. Blood cultures. I'm sending those off definitely because I think uh, uh, Jenna said a, uh, yeah, said a really good answer there, thinking that maybe there's some in endocarditis or bacteremia. So I think it's a great idea, let's send blood cultures. It's gonna take some time for those to come back. So they're pending at the moment. The other thing is he's hypotensive. He's got an elevated white count, he's tachycardic, he's hypotensive. I should get a lactate, make sure that he doesn't have a lactic acidosis. Also, and it was, it was super elevated. Generally you want that less than two, his is six. Um, and then he was found down for maybe up to 12 hours. Um, so I want to think about rhabdo as well, and his CK came back at 10,000, which is pretty high as well. Um, so I saw some of you guys also put in there like ABGs. I think that's a great thing. Definitely can do an ABG um, to see if he has any uh, acidosis. Um, again, you maybe pick up that he has a metabolic acidosis, possibly also a concomitant respiratory um, uh, alkalosis as well because he's breathing really quickly. So yeah, definitely could do an ABG. I think that's not a bad idea. Um, and then I think someone else said tropes, which I think is a good idea. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Well, let's get it some tropes and see what he has as well. Maybe there is a troponin leak. Maybe he's having some ischemia uh, present as well or uh, in STEMI, STEMI. So definitely a good idea. You can throw some tropes in there as well. I think that's a great idea. Okay. Um, yeah. I think everybody did a pretty good job. Um, hitting what like what, what we kind of needed here. So yeah, adding on, I think it's a great idea, adding on some tropes, adding on an ABG, that's fine. Definitely can use that, okay? Next thing, so I think we definitely have been able to surmount that he's got an infection, he's got a acute liver failure potentially, he's got hypokalemia, he maybe has a coagulopathy, he has a history of IV drug abuse potentially from this heroin, he's hyperglycemic, he's got a lactic acidosis, and he's got rhabdo. <laughs> What images do you guys want to get? We should think about some images, right? Please, I want at the top of your list, the, the most important thing with this guy, um, based upon his neuro exam. I really want you guys to think. So think for just a little bit of time here and think about what kind of images you guys want here. Okay? So I'll give you guys a quick second. Yep, Chris, PA, um, yeah, definitely. He needs a CT, every, oh my gosh, everybody's saying it, CT, 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 CT. <laughs> yeah, he needs a CT of his head. He's got some neuro abnormalities definitely present here. So CT, CT, yeah. I think you guys are right on point. Um, there's gonna be some other ones too, all right? So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about those. But definitely the most important one is a CT scan. So what did we get here? What did we think was the most pertinent based upon his kind of uh, history, physical exam? Um, and some of his labs. A non-contrast CT, that's the most important is what he needs there. We'll take a look at what his looked like for a second because you guys told us that we should kind of add in some images and we did that for you. So we got some CTs to take a look at here in a little second. Um, we did an echo. Um, I just think a little bedside echo is helpful. Um, but you, if you want to, you know, if you're pretty proficient with a bedside echo, do a little bedside echo, transthoracic, take a look there. Why would I want to do a transthoracic echo? He's got, I think someone already said it, um, the Jenna, and he's got a fever, he's got hypotension, he's got petechial lesions. Ooh, what could those petechial lesions be, guys, uh, that you can see on the hands, um, palms of the hands maybe, sometimes within the context of fever, IV drug abuse, um, and uh, a, a murmur, a visible, uh, uh, sorry, audible on auscultation. There's particular lesions that you might want to think about on there. They're kind of, they like to throw these on your kind of your board exams. Yeah, so Janeway lesions, Osler's nose, yeah, absolutely. Osler's nose, remember, painful, ouch. Osler's, ouch. Um, so definitely could be some Osler's nodes or some Janeway lesions there. The other thing is I wanted to get a chest x-ray. 
he was having this acute respiratory kind of failure. He's acutely hypoxic. Um, and he was also vomiting. He probably aspirated. So I want to definitely we're going to have to intubate this guy. He was getting bagged and he was at 88%. Um, we're definitely going to have to intubate this guy. So we're going to intubate him and get a chest x-ray anyway post-intubation to make sure that the endotracheal tube isn't like in his gut or something, right? So we got to make sure we get that done. Yeah, everybody's starting to kind of pick up on what may be going on here. You guys are so dang smart. Dang you guys. <laughs> All right. Uh, 12 lead EKG is another thing. He's tachycardic. I think also people you want troponins. It doesn't hurt to also kind of just get a, a 12 lead EKG to see if there's any ischemia or infarction present as well. KUB, just when you're doing, when you suspect someone has sepsis, you got to try to find an infectious source anywhere. We did a CBC, we did a urinalysis, we did blood cultures, we got a chest x-ray. We can also throw in a KUB um, uh, just to look at the abdomen, see if there's any bowel obstruction, pneumoperitoneum, any like thickening of the bowel wall and like maybe a C. diff or something like that. Um, and then get a CT of his abdomen and pelvis if you really had the time, but by far the most important thing on the top of the list is a non-contrast CT. Get that done first. Get that echo, you know, get the chest x-ray, 12 lead EKG. You can get a KUB pretty quickly. And then a CT of the abdomen of the pelvis. When we did the KUB, I'm not going to show you guys any images of that because there was nothing particular there. He didn't have any bowel obstruction. He didn't have any pneumoperitoneum or any, any visible edema of the bowel walls. His CT of the abdomen and pelvis also didn't show any source of infection or pathology, particularly uh, within his abdomen and pelvis. He just had kind of a hypertrophy to nodular liver, which may be related to his underlying cirrhosis. All right, so... Let's take a look at this guy's non-contrast CT scan. All right, so ready? Good. All right, sorry, I'm trying to get used to this. This is different for us. So, all right, we got here a, a CT scan. We're using Radiopedia. So let's go ahead and take a look here. If we kind of scroll up through this really nice and slow here. You guys tell me what you guys see here. So, so far we're in that, so if we were to look here, we're in the posterior fossa here. So it's gonna be your cerebellum. This is your fourth ventricle. Okay, then you're gonna have your pons here in front of it. We're already seeing some abnormal stuff here if we come up, so we got pons. You got your temporal lobes right here as well. Go up a little bit more. Oh my gosh, we're already starting to see something. I don't even know if we need to keep going. Oh my gosh, holy crap. Holy crap, this guy has got a monstrosity of a bleed, right? So he's got a massive, massive intracerebral hemorrhage here. So, I mean, you could pick this up, you know, from like a mile away. So it's a relatively easy CT scan to be very definitively diagnostic here. This guy's got a whopping ICH. Now, let's try to be particular and kind of say what lobe it's in. So here you got your frontal lobe, right? Here's your frontal lobe, and then you also have part of your parietal lobe back here. So this is extending from the frontal lobe and in, even into the parietal lobe here. So he's got a, and then this is the left side, this is the right side. So he's got a left fronto parietal ICH. What else can we say about this? Not only is it a left frontal parietal ICH and it's big, uh, we can't measure it, but if you were to measure it, you would measure from like the, the, the largest part of the bleed. So you'd maybe start here, measure it to here in centimeters, then start here, measure it to here in centimeters. And then you would look at the um, coronal view. And then you would measure from the largest part of the bleed from this top piece to this top piece. And you'd have them all in centimeters. And the whole thing that you would do is you would multiply all of those together. So A times B times the C from your coronal section and then divide that by two. And that'll give you the size of his ICH. This is huge. Um, no matter what, it's greater than 30 milliliters. So he's gonna get a point on his ICH score. All right, so going back, left frontal parietal ICH, and then what, the, what else can we surmi surmise from this? Look at these freaking ventricles. They're gargantuous, they're ballooning, right? So they got hydrocephalus as well present. Um, and then there's blood layering in these ventricles as well. So he's got some intraventricular extension as well, okay? So he's got some intraventricular hemorrhage, he's got some hydrocephalus, what else? He's got, look, this whole bleed is really starting to shift things to the opposite side. So from the left side, he's shifting some of that actual brain tissue and other structures to the, to the actual right side in this case. So he's going to have some midline shift. And most likely, 
a part of that brain tissue is going to herniate underneath the thalx, causing a subfalcian herniation. And if we were to move down even a little bit more here into like the area of the midbrain, he's probably also going to be compressing his midbrain um, on that one side. The uncus is probably going to slip out from that tentorium and press on the midbrain, causing uncle herniation as well. Either way, this this is a, this is a catastrophic bleed. Okay, so let's go back here. What can we surmise from that CT scan? He's got a left frontal parietal ICH. He's got IVH. He's got hydrocephalus. He's got midline shift. He's got subfalcian herniation as well. And if we were to calculate this out, we would use that ABC um, divided by two to give us how large of the volume of that bleed is. So this is pretty scary um, bleed here. Okay. Everybody's killing it. All right. Let's move on to the next thing. The next thing that we wanted was an echo, right? What do you think we're going to see on that echo? What do you guys think? Boom, you guys are on it. You guys are too darn smart. You see here's your left atrium, here's your left ventricle, here's your right ventricle, and up here would be your right atrium. Here's your interventricular septum there in the midline. So you see this big whopping vegetation that's present there um, on those mitral valves. There's a mitral valve vegetation in the context of him having fever. We didn't, I'm telling you already, his blood cultures do come back positive. And he's also got evidence of a vegetation and a murmur and with his history of, well, his uh, found, finding of uh, heroin, uh, so suggestive of potential IV drug abuse in his track marks, um, this is likely infective endocarditis, okay? I want you guys to think about something here. Think about, start thinking about causes of intracerebral hemorrhage. Start thinking about causes of intracerebral hemorrhage. Why did that guy develop a bleed, okay? It may be a couple different things, but start thinking about why. And I want you to think about what it's called when it's related to infective endocarditis. Okay, let's move on. What was the other thing that we wanted? We wanted a chest x-ray. He got, uh, he probably aspirated, he got a, he got a, a, a tube down his, his trachea, right? So we wanna make sure that that's in the right place. In this case, I couldn't find a, an image of it, but we're gonna look here. Here is our chest x-ray. Just pretend that there is an endotracheal tube that's you know, here between the, the clavicles and the carina. But anyway, this is what we see when we get that chest x-ray. All right, so you guys, when we read a chest x-ray, we'll have lectures on this in the future, but there's a systematic approach. You go A, B, C, D, E. So airway, you follow your trachea down, make sure it's midline, make sure that you're feeding into the carinas. Then uh, and from the carina into your bronchi, so right bronchi, left bronchi. Then look at your lungs, look to see if they're really hyperinflated. They are pretty big. He, well, he also has COPD, right? Um, are they small? Are they atelectatic? Is he not taking in good inspiration or are they collapsed because of some underlying reason? Then look at the lungs to look to see if they look really opacified or really white. A little bit opacified diffusely over here, but way more opacification on that left side there. So definitely he's got some opacities there on that left side in the context of what happened, most likely suspicious of pneumonia. Then from there, is there any really darkness on the chest x-ray? So is there any loss of vascular markings as you go out towards the pleura? Maybe suspicious of a pneumothorax. Look at your hilar area. Any like really opacifications or nodular formations there suggestive of TB or um, uh, sarcoidosis or cancer or anything like that, okay? Um, and then from there, move into uh, the heart. Is the heart look big? There's no cardiomegaly. You can determine that by seeing if the, um, the heart fits in one side of the hemithorax. It would. So he doesn't have any cardiomegaly present. Then check your diaphragms. Do they look elevated? Usually the right one should be a little bit bigger than the left one, a little bit higher up. Look at those costophrenic angles. Do they look blunted? They definitely look a little blunted on that left side because of the opacities there. And then E is everything else. Look at the bones, look at the tubes, look at any lines that are feeding into this guy. Okay, and if he did have an endotracheal tube, it would be between the clavicles and the carina. Okay, so we can definitely from this in the clinical context and his chest x-ray, it seems like he's got pneumonia, probably from aspiration and that big old opacity there in that left lung. <laughs> oh my gosh. So this guy, Ray Allison, I, I believe you were right. That he did, he said. <laughs> it shouldn't be, I shouldn't laugh. This is not funny. This is a, a, a fake case. It's fictitious, so we're meant to learn from this. But yeah, this guy is really, really sick and it's not looking good for him with all the conditions he's got. Okay, so we got pneumonia, we got infective endocarditis, we got a left frontal parietal ICH. What else did we want? 
we wanted a 12 lead EKG, right? He's tachycardic. We also got some troponins because we wanted to rule out any ischemia or infarction as well. So let's go ahead and do that. Got a 12 lead EKG here. If we read that 12 lead EKG, go through your systematic approach of the 12 lead EKG, what do we do? Is it going too fast, too slow, or normal? He's going fast. Then you say what? Is the uh, R to R interval uh, regular, irregular? It's regular. Is the, P, is the uh, QRS is narrow or wide? They're narrow. So he's got a narrow, regular tachycardia. Is there any P waves in lead two? Yes, they're upright. Is there any inverted P waves in AVR? Yes. So it's sinus rhythm. So he's got a sinus tachycardia. There may be also some other abnormalities here, but he's got a sinus tachycardia, which again, makes sense based upon his clinical scenario. Okay? So that's what we got there. So here's where I want you guys to start writing. This is a good, this is really good practice. This is what I think helps, is gonna help you when you start getting into clinical practice. You need to be able to try to have a very good uh, systematic approach to every person's condition. So sometimes it's not going to be just one diagnosis and that's all you're managing. They're going to have a bunch of other concomitant conditions that they may have going on. This guy's got a lot going on. I want you to list down all that you can think of. You might have extra stuff that I missed, but these are the big, big things that I saw that I need to address for this patient for his assessment. So what kind of diagnoses do we have here? And I gotta address while he's getting admitted into the ICU. So take some time to think about those. You guys are, this case is really hard. Good, I'm, I wanted it to be a little bit harder. You guys were too dang smart. Oh, Shelly, you're very smart. She's good. All right, and then so coagulopathy, endocarditis. Opacities from aspiration pneumonia from Christian. There's so much to think about. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot. So here's what I got, um, and this is the big stuff that I wanna address um, in this patient, okay? Here it is, ready? Babushk. So he's got, what the heck? Hold on, sorry guys. Uh, so he's got what? He's got a left frontal parietal ICH with IVH, Hydrocephalus, he's got a lot of edema too. I didn't mention that in the image as well. Um, but his, his image suggests definitely some diffuse cerebral edema. He's got midline shift. We can calculate that also, determining how much one side's, how much you're pushing that septum pellucidum from the, the midline of the skull based upon like the point of the floor, the Falk cerebri would be. He's got that. He's also got some brainstem compression from that uncle herniation and some subfalcine herniation. He's got infective endocarditis. Okay, I told you already, he's got some blood cultures that came back positive. Okay, he's got septic shock because he's hypotensive. He is um, uh, tachycardic. He is um, hypotensive. He's tachypnic. He's got a lot of things going on there. So he's definitely had some septic shock. He had acute hypoxic respiratory failure. He came in super hypoxic, probably secondary to his aspiration pneumonia and Probably because with that big sucker that he's got in the brain that's bleeding, it's probably pressing on his brainstem, affecting his pontine respiratory centers and, and uh, medullary respiratory centers from being able to stimulate respiration, your rate and your rhythm. Uh, so he's probably got a combination of aspiration pneumonia and also this decreasing um, function, ability to protect his airway from that large bleed. Um, he's got pneumonia, aspiration pneumonia. He's got COPD, the history of COPD, but he may have a COPD exacerbation maybe. Um, he's got acute kidney injury. He's got hypokalemia. He's got lactic acidosis. If you wanted to add another one in there, he's also got rhabdomyolysis. He's got acute on chronic liver failure, and he's got type one diabetes mellitus. We didn't talk about this. Maybe we'll check a little bit later. Does he also have DKA? <laughs> Yeah, Kevson keyboard, freaking heck, where do you start? I know, right? There's a lot going on with this guy. And that's where I think we're going to learn a lot from these cases is approaching every condition and trying to think about what is the plan for him. This is where you, you really start to connect multiple modalities. You don't want to just focus on one disease. Try to really focus on treating the entire, uh, you know, all the systems together holistically. So let's start by having a plan to attack multiple systems. So the way I like to attack um, a plan on a patient is I like to go based upon dealing with the nervous system first, 
And then I go into the cardiovascular system, the, the pulmonary system, the kidneys, the GI, and so on and so forth. So we're gonna tackle these systematically. Okay, ready? First thing, neuroplan. This guy's got a big bleed, right? So we gotta figure out what the cause of it is. So a couple people had already said it and you guys are so darn smart. That's very impressive. Not, I'm not even gonna joke with you. That is extremely impressive that someone said uh, mycotic aneurysm. That's really awesome. So infective endocarditis, he probably popped one of those little septic emboli on that vegetation on the mitral valve, probably fed up through his carotid system, got stuck in a cerebral vessel, made more lo lobular or lobar uh, location, and started to infect that tissue of the cerebral vessel wore away at it, causing the necrosis of it, ruptured it. Um, and then that caused that bleed. But he also had another thing. He also had the coagulopathy, probably related to his, his cirrhosis. So whenever you have very, very bad liver failure, you're not able to produce proper uh, proteins, in this case, like albumin and coagulation proteins. So in this case, he's not producing like factors two, seven, nine, ten, And so because of that, he's more likely to bleed because he doesn't have those procoagulants there. And if you guys remember, he did have an elevated INR. So this bleed could be two things, maybe. We don't completely know, this is made up. But if we think about this systematically and logistically, his bleed is probably due to infective endocarditis from mycotic aneurysm and coagulopathy because of his uh, cirrhosis. So what can we do quickly? Quickly, reverse the coagulopathy. So I want you guys to remember that whenever you guys have somebody with um, a coagulopathy, most likely cirrhosis, and you're trying to reverse or change the INR, the quickest drug to do that is prothrombin complex concentrate, PCC. There's another one called FFP. Um, and then you can also give vitamin K as well uh, in this situation, but the quickest one that you're gonna get the most effect from right away is gonna be PCC. Um, and generally, whenever someone has an INR that's like 2.1, so between like two to four, you can just give them 25 units per kg of PCC and then just recheck the INR to see if you're less than 1.7 in this guy's case. The other thing is this is a neurosurgical emergency. Right away, I gotta go ahead and try to decompress that skull. He's got midline shift, he's got hydrocephalus, he's got blood in those ventricles, he's got edema like crazy. So we need to try to pull that skull cap off on the left so that instead of him herniating downwards through his foramen magnum, he herniates through that skull uh, defect or when, where we take that bone flap off, okay? So we can allow for him to herniate through that actual trans like calvaria, uh, so through the skull, which is you know that's better than herniating through your foramen magnum, right? Then while we're there, neurosurgery can make the decision if they want to evacuate that blood. There's probably so much blood that there's an unlikeliness to evacuate any of that blood. And then put a drain and intracranial pressure, okay? Now with a mycotic aneurysm, any kind of aneurysm, generally interventional radiology will be involved and they'll potentially coil that aneurysm. In the setting of this severe of a bleed, it's, it's plus or minus, it's depending upon IR's decision to go in there if he's still actively bleeding from that mycotic aneurysm. Um, then we would go in, maybe do a CTA and stuff like that, and then again, or send him to IR, they would do an angiogram, and then go in and potentially coil that mycotic aneurysm. Again, it's really dependent upon the scenario. But again, something to just think about and have on your plan. The other thing is he's got a lot of edema. A lot of edema, right? He's gonna he's gonna swell really really bad. So we should start him on some medications that can help him to really make his blood salty and dehydrate the brain, the normal brain tissue, whatever he has left, to really decrease the space inside of that skull based upon what's called the Monroe Kelly doctrine, right? So we'll give him some hypertonic saline, three percent hypertonic saline, um, and then you have to have a target. You want to make him salty make them as salty as you can between 150 to 155. And that'll pull and suck some of the water out of those healthy brain cells. Um, after the CT scan, I was uh, I was out. I called a neurosurgeon and said, good luck. <laughs> that was Rob, I like it. Yeah, that's, how about it? This this guy's not gonna do well, but we gotta do the best we can to, to give him the best shot possible for this guy, right? So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna give him the 3%. We're gonna uh, try to, uh, dehydrate the brain the best that we can. But if his ICP is really, really shot, shoot up, what's an abnormal ICP? Greater than 20 millimeters of mercury generously for like a couple minutes, like five, maybe to 20 minutes, it's sustained. Um, so if that happens and his ICPs are really, really climbing, you can give a quick emergent bolus of 23.4% hypertonic saline, really, really salty blood or mannitol. So those are things that you can do for that. The other thing, with that large of a bleed near the cortex, you, that blood really agitates those um, gray matter, uh, the cerebral, uh, the, the um, cell bodies in the gray matter, the cerebral cortex, 
agitates them and triggers that asynchronous kind of like ep uh, epileptogenic focus, which can cause seizures. So he's definitely at risk for seizures. Let's start him on something like Keppra. Um, Levetiracetam is the generic. Uh, 500 milligrams twice a day for at least seven days, just until we can treat, you know, make sure that he doesn't seize. Especially in this condition, sometimes a person may not visibly tonically, conically seize. They may have what's called non-convulsive status epilepticus, and you don't actually pick it up from their exam. Um, they're just really lethargic. Okay. I do not like mannitol because then it makes the patient diuresis, then play and catch up with it. IV. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's very true. Mannitol is an osmotic diuretic, and it definitely Jenna uh, Petruca. Petruca. I hope I said that name right. Sorry. Yeah, I prefer twenty three point four percent. So the evidence again, there's there, the evidence doesn't really suggest one over the other. Um, there may be some slight superiority over the twenty three point four percent. There is always these things with hypertonic saline potentially causing hypotension, causing diuresis because you're dropping their fluids. And yes, you have to catch up by giving them more, more fluid boluses. Um, also, this this uh, phenomenon of rebound ICPs as well, potentially. So yeah, I prefer to give 23.4% over mannitol as well. Okay, but it's whatever you have. If you don't have a central line, you gotta push mannitol uh, because that's the one that you can't push through via peripheral IV, okay? All right, so I think that's a good neural plan. What do you guys think? Hopefully that's a good neural plan. If there's anything else that you guys think, put it down in the comment section to help out other people as well, and I can take a look at it as well. But this is what I would do, and I think this is a pretty good plan for him. Cardiac plan. This guy's got septic shock, right? What do we get? What's the cause? Potentially infective endocarditis and pneumonia. All right, so he's got he's got a kind of a double whammy there. So let's keep those MAPs greater than 65. That's kind of going to be our goal for him is keeping MAPs greater than 65 mean arterial pressure. How can we do that? Sepsis criteria says you give 30 cc's per kg of IV fluids um, and then just keep bolusing them PRN um, to maintain um, just a, a euvolemia um, because they probably will third space. So keep them euvolemic. You can do that by determining if their volume resuscitated based on IVC ultrasounds, urine output, central venous pressures. There's a bunch of different ways um, that you can do it. Uh, we resuscitate him with fluids though and he doesn't respond. What do we do? We put them on pressors. We're gonna clamp down on those vessels, increase the inotropic action of the heart with first line levofed or norepinephrine. We do that as an infusion. Um, generally certain institutions, there may be weight-based, it may be max out at 30, um, and then again, you switch to another drug. It just depends upon your institution. Um, most usually say max out at 30, add on a second line agent. If you're still not reaching that pressure goal of greater than 65, and that's where you can add on neo, also known as phenylephrine, or vasopressin. Okay, so again, those are options there. We'll give him fluid resuscitation, we'll keep bolusing him, and we'll put him on a presser. And if we need to, we'll add a second one if we're not meet, meeting our MAP goal. Also, kind of going in line with what Jenna said, I think it's a good idea, he needs an arterial line. We're trying to measure his mean arterial pressures accurately. If we're going off of a blood pressure cuff, sometimes that isn't gonna give us accurate MAPs. Let's put an arterial line in, and let's get a central line. Why? I should have put this in here. Not only do we need to push high dose vasopressors, you can push vasopressors. It's important to remember, you can push vasopressors through a peripheral IV, but as you start getting to higher concentrations, there is this risk of extravasation of that presser and then causing necrosis as well. I love this channel. I'm a critical care paramedic. Ninja Nerd is a superstar. The LG, thanks man, that's awesome. That's so cool, thanks buddy. So yeah, I would um, get an arterial line, get a central line for two reasons. One is we're gonna push a lot of vasopressors on this guy, theoretically, and you don't wanna extravasate, especially if you give vasopressin. Vasopressin is the one that you really, really don't wanna have to give peripheral IV because it, it can cause necrosis of those digits. So put a central line in. One is because if we have to get 23.4%, you have to give it through that. And also if we're gonna be pushing high dose vasopressors and fluids. The other thing is to determine, another thing for fluid resuscitation is using your lactates. You can use lactates. Um, as a measure of potential uh, perfusion. So if his lactates are still bumping and continuing to go up, uh, we check those every six hours and then kind of bolus them uh, based on that. Big thing to remember, I wanted to tell uh, you guys this. Uh, sometimes I know a lot of people like epinephrine from the last septic shock uh, case study. Epinephrine is a good one. Just be aware if you're checking lactates and you put someone on epinephrine, their lactates will actually go up. And it's because of the epinephrine, maybe not because of them actually still being like septic and not perfusing tissues. Epinephrine actually stimulates those beta-2 receptors in the liver and leads to increased lactic acid production. So just remember that if you put someone on epi and you notice their lactates are going up, you're like, oh, dang it. It could be because of the epinephrine uh, that's actually causing a type B lactic acidosis, not a type A, okay? All right, and then we'll talk about the broad spectrum antibiotics, but because of his infective endocarditis and because of his pneumonia, we're gonna start some antibiotics for them. We'll talk about that in the infectious disease plan. 
And again, continuing on with the infective endocarditis. Okay, that's our cardio plan. Hopefully you guys are still with me here. Uh, pulmonary plan, he's got acute hypoxic respiratory failure. We gotta intubate this guy. We should have done, you know, in the, in the acute treatment plan, uh, when this guy's coming into the ED and he's getting bagged and he's hypoxic and all of this other stuff, we should definitely uh, intubate this guy, get a post-intubation chest x-ray, make sure it's in the right place, <laughs> and then put them into a ventilator mode. He's definitely going to need to be um, uh, intubated because of that bleed as well. He's got a big whopping bleed. There's no way he's going to be able to protect his airway, as we've seen him being unresponsive. And he's definitely got a GCS less than 8. So what we'll do is... Uh, we'll start him off on a particular mode. It depends. It's really dependent upon you. You can put him in continuous mechanical ventilation, CMV, or ASV adaptive support ventilation. Um, we can talk about these in future videos about mechanical ventilation modes, but um, you can start him off on CMV. is kind of the classic when they come in, and you control the FiO2. Start off at 100 and go down until you get to a particular FiO2 where their SpO2 is greater than 94%. Um, you can give a particular PEEP, a positive index vibratory pressure, um, and that can target, again, your SpO2s uh, based upon them, keeping them greater than 94. Try not to go too high, though, because of the risk of barotrauma. You also control your tidal volumes and your respiratory rate with CMV. So you can pick a tidal volume. I just like 6 to 8 cc's per kg. Good lung, uh, protective lung ventilation there. Um, and then I control my respiratory rate with uh, 20 breaths per minute. And then again, when I get my ABGs, I can model it, modulate that uh, tidal volume respiratory rate to keep my CO2 particularly in a range of 35 to 45, or unless I want permissive hypercapnia in this case. And then when you do inspiratory pauses, you want to check your plateau pressures and keep those suckers less than 30 because it can cause barotrauma if they're too high, and keep your driving pressure less than 18 centimeters of water. Okay, so, and if you do adaptive support ventilation, we're not gonna go too crazy on that, but there's other things that you control, FiO2, PEEP, and you control their percent minute ventilation. But again, the machine's so dang smart, it kind of configures and changes based upon the patient's needs. It's a closed circuit ventilation. Um, also get ABGs, we already talked about that, just to make good modifications to our vent settings. And if we are in CMV, he, you're, he's probably gonna wanna breathe above the ventilator because of a, a likely um, having to have this increased respiratory drive. So. Uh, we can get fentanyl and propofol to kind of make him synchronous with the ventilator and just get serial chest x-rays to make sure that the ammonia is improving and we're not fluid overloading him and so on and so forth. And then while we got to be holistic, treat the COPD. If he's wheezing and he's got all this other conditions, treat him with albuterol and, uh, and ipitropium nebulizing treatments, also known as duoneps. And then we'll talk about how we treat his pneumonia. We'll talk about that in the infectious disease plan. Okay, hope that one helps. Got a question? Why is the target uh, greater than ninety four percent? Isn't the patient also? Had a, yeah. So with this this patient with that large of a bleed, um, I want to perfuse that brain the best I can. Um, so he's going to have high intracranial pressures. When you have high intracranial pressures, that smashes onto the brain and reduces the amount of blood that can feed the brain, right? And so that reduces what's called his cerebral perfusion pressures. So what we have to do with that is increase his mean arterial pressure. But he's septic. So he's already hypotensive. So I'm having to give him fluids and pressors to push his MAP up. But if his CPP isn't still great, I also want to give him as much oxygen. So any blood that I do get to him, he's getting as much oxygen as I can possibly give him. Now, if I'm not able to maintain an SpO2 goal to give him protective lung ventilation greater than 94, I can adjust to try to get to you know 88 to 92 percent. But again, I I prefer with that large of a bleed to try to keep it as you know a little bit higher at greater than 94. Hyperoxia is not beneficial, but I'd like to keep it a little bit more so I can perfuse as much oxygen to the brain. Okay. Q kidney injury. He's got an AKI based upon his baseline creatinine bump from 1.1 to 2. Point, I forget. It went to 2. Point something. Either way, there was a it was definitely a two time difference um, in his uh, his creatinine. Probably or likely from a septic shock. He's not perfusing those kidneys, so he's probably got like a pre-renal AKI, but he's also probably got an intrarenal AKI because he's got rhabdo. So he's probably spilling a lot of that myoglobin um, into the uh, kidney tubules, which is causing maybe some acute tubular necrosis. So he's probably got a little bit of a mixed intrarenal and pre-renal AKI. We're going to fluid bolus them. We're going to use vasopressors to perfuse the kidneys as well. And then we're going to try to trend that CK and lactate to see if we need to, again, keep giving more fluid as well. Um, and try to avoid nephrotoxic agents as you can because those can also you know, worsen the un underlying AKI. With him being this bad, we may have to consider continuous renal replacement therapy, a type of dialysis when someone's hemodynamically unstable if his AKI doesn't improve in this scenario. Okay, He's also got hypokalemia, 2.8. 
It's the least of our worries right now, but let's try to be holistic. Let's give him some potassium. How do we give potassium to get us to gold? We want to get it to at least greater than 3.5. He's 2.8. I need to go up at least 8, you know, 0.8 units. So you guys remember 10 milliequivalents of potassium is equal to a 0.1 increase um, in potassium. Um, so if I give 40 milliequivalents as an oral form, okay, which uh, he probably has an OG tube, an oral gastric tube because he's intubated, or an NG tube, I'm going to give him 40 through that route, and then I'm going to give him 10 milliequivalents because you don't want to give too much in IV because it can cause phlebitis and really burn. Um, and we want to try to help this guy out as much as we can, uh, considering how sick he is. So I, you only give like 10 milli equivalents and you give them as K riders and I'll give like four doses. So that's technically I'll get eventually get 40 milli equivalents via IV. That's 0.4. And then I'll give him 40 oral. That's 0 0.4. 0 0.4 plus 0 0.4 is 0 0.8. Hopefully when I check a BMP, he'll be up at 3.6. Another thing to keep in mind clinically is let's say that you're giving someone potassium and it's not going up. Uh, check a mag. It's always important to do that. I think it's a little trick because sometimes you can keep, 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 keep giving potassium and it doesn't go up and then you check their mag and it's low. You give them magnesium and then you give them potassium and then it corrects. So another quick little trick to think about there. Lactic acidosis. We already know this. Again, we're kind of treating this. Most likely it's related to a septic shock. Okay. It, there could also be some under, other underlying issues there as well. Uh, but we're going to keep fluid resuscitating and keep training those lactates as well. Okay. All righty, <laughs> acute on chronic liver failure. This guy has got acute on chronic liver failure. He had an elevation in his uh, ALT, AST, ALKFOS. He's also probably got a coagulopathy because he had that elevated INR. So he's got a lot of things going on there. What's probably his chronic liver failure is probably from the chronic hepatitis and his chronic alcohol use. And septic shock just you know took him and tipped him overboard into acute exacerbation on top of his chronic liver failure. So what do we do? The coagulopathy is kind of the big thing because of that brain. We don't want him to keep bleeding into that already gargantuous bleed, so let's correct that coagulopathy. He's got an INR of 2.1. Again, we can say whenever it's 2 to 4, you can give him like 25 units of PCC, prothrombin complex concentrate, also known as K-Centra, um, and just try to target an INR of you know, less than 1.7, ideally. He's also probably got some uh, hyperaminemia, which can also cause a lot of problems and lead to um, some encephalopathy as well, and that can increase the risk of seizures. So let's check his ammonia levels and see if, and I think someone said that previously, check his ammonia levels, good thought, and then we'll treat him with lactulose or rifaximin if it is really, really high and causing potential encephalopathy and risk of seizures. Keep training his LFTs, see if they improve or if they continue to worsen. And he's an alcoholic. Let's try to be holistic and treat him uh, for that uh, risk of developing delirium tremens, maybe 48, 96 hours later. Um, so put him on the CWA protocol, give him thymine, give him folate because of those nutritional deficiencies when someone's drinking a lot of alcohol. And then benzodiazepines to control if he does develop any seizures. Um, so like lorazepam, one milligram. Okay, infectious disease plan. So this guy's got infective endocarditis, probably because of his undisclosed IV drug abuse, heroin. Um, so what you start off with broad spectrum antibiotics. Whenever someone comes in and you got like these positive blood cultures, fever, he's septic, or the whole nine yards, give them broad spectrum antibiotics. In this case, we're gonna put them on vancomycin to cover like MRSA, um, and then cefepine, because that covers like your pseudomonas, that covers a lot of gram negatives as well. And then his blood cultures did come back a little bit later. They were only MRSA, so we'll keep him on Vanco, and we don't really need the cefepime for the septic endocarditis, uh, for the infective endocarditis. Whenever you put someone on vancomycin, though, you got to think about something. <laughs> he has rhabdo. He has septic shock. That's probably going to be that's the cause of his AKI. You put them on Vanco, and then on top of that, they don't clear that vancomycin. That can also injure the kidneys and worsen their AKI. So check their trough levels to make sure that they're not super therapeutic because that's going to worsen their underlying AKI and make it even worse, put them into eventual renal failure and they're going to end up on dialysis. Okay. Pneumonia. He's probably aspiration, but could it be an effective endocarditis or something called the Osler's triad? It's more particular to streptococcus pneumonia, but sometimes someone who has a septic um, uh, infective endocarditis, pneumonia, and meningitis can sometimes be seen as a triad. Usually it's that strep pneumonia, but we, we don't know. It could be infective endocarditis. Unlikely, more likely aspiration is his cause, but we're going to treat with some broad spectrum antibiotics on this guy. Same thing. Um, we're going to get him on Vank and Cefepime. His sputum cultures came back. It was MRSA, Cleb, so we'll put him back on the Cefepime. Um, to keep them to cover that um, Cleb CL as well. And then just keep monitoring those trough levels for that vancomycin. We don't want to worsen his already present AKI. Okay? 
You guys still with me? I think we got a pretty good infectious disease plan for this guy. We're at the last part. His type 1 diabetes, all right? If there wasn't already enough things that we're dealing with with this guy, he's also crazy hyperglycemic. I wouldn't say crazy, but it's high. Uh, uh, 280 milligrams per deal, I think it was. So he's pretty high. Um, and hyperglycemia can make a lot of things a lot worse, okay? Uh, so we really want to try to control that hyperglycemia. So I like to start off insulin infusions whenever they've had a really high reading or they've, been, they've had consistent readings greater than 200. Um, put them on an insulin drip or an infusion, you get a pretty good steady control with regular uh, insulin or Humulin R, okay? And then if you really want to, if this guy's starting to get tube feeds because there's not a chance in this world he's going to be able to eat food orally um, with that large of a bleed, probably going to have to put like a, a, a nasogastric tube or a Dobhov in to feed him. Um, so eventually we can give him like basal bolus insulin when we get a steady control of regular insulin. Um, usually over a 24 hour period, if they've been pretty steady, you can take the last eight hours and determine how many units they were getting average. So if we were to just do this for fun, two units he's getting over the last eight hours over a 24 hour period of pretty stable sugar readings on the insulin drip. You take two units that he's taking average, multiply that by the 24 hour period, and then that amount of units, which would be two times 24 is 48, multiply that by 80%. That's how much Lantus or long acting basal insulin that you would give. And that comes out to about uh, 38 units total. Split that into BID because that's too much to give in one dose. Um, and then the other thing is if you want to determine kind of the uh, rapid acting insulins that you give with the tube feeds that he's going to be getting, you take and you multiply his Lantus dose, um, which is 38 units times point, uh, 10%, which you end up getting like close to four units. Um, and so you'll get four units of Humilog that goes in every four hours for your tube feeds. Okay, and then just keep monitoring his glucose levels um, every four hours. Um, and then uh, just to make sure that he doesn't become hypoglycemic or he goes back up again if you put him on these basal bolus insulin and he's not being controlled on that, then you gotta probably put him back on the insulin infusion. If he does become hypoglycemic, you gotta give some, some sugar or some glucagon. But if you give glucagon, step away from the patient because it's gonna cause them to vomit. So might have to give some Zofran or um, Ondansetron, uh, the generic, to help them with that. But that's kind of the big thing. And also with someone has uh, diabe diabetes, potentially DKA, could he have DKA? We didn't really have the labs to definitively diagnose. Is it that important in this context? Maybe. He's gonna have an acidosis. If we checked a urine ketones, let's say his urine ketones were positive or his blood ketones were positive, he has DKA, you're still gonna treat them with insulin, you're still gonna give him IV fluids. He had hypokalemia, just keep giving him potassium because insulin's probably gonna shift that potassium into the cell as well. So you're gonna have to keep protect, uh, correcting that potassium as well. Okay, what do you guys think? You think we saved this guy? So no, uh, this guy's really sick and I think this is a good learning point, uh, especially coming, some, someone as new as me going into the field you always wanna to try to do the best that you can and hope to save every patient that you get. But sometimes they are just really too sick. Um, and you can do everything that you want, give the best possible care that you can, um, and just sometimes they, they, they succumb to the, to the severe, severity of their diseases in this guy's case. So what could happen to this guy? His ICH, he's probably gonna develop those high ICPs because a lot of that blood, he's gonna herniate and he's probably gonna become brain dead. His septic shock, that's probably gonna worsen in this guy's case, we're saying it, 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 again, this isn't a real case, but let's say that he got max on levofed, phenylephrine, his white counts kept rising, okay? Let's say his pneumonia ended up progressing to ARDS, he required prone positioning, ECMO, and then his AKI worsened because of all that vanco, the sepsis, the rhabdo, and he ended up requiring CRT. So in this kind of situation, uh, this is, I think, whoever said that, yeah, he did, uh, it's it's kind of true. This guy was really really sick. You shouldn't let pro you shouldn't let the severity of someone coming in determine how good of a treatment you'll give them or how bad of a treatment you'll give them or if you only give them the minimum amount of treatment because you suspect that they're not going to have a great prognosis. Don't ever do that. Give them the best treatment as long as they want that. Their family wants that. They want you to give them the best treatment possible. You go all out, okay? And and you do the best that you can um, for this patient, which I think that we did to together in engineers for this patient. So. I, I really hope that this um, helped and I hope that you guys liked it. And I, I hope that we can continue to keep doing these and keep learning together and gaining some wisdom. So next thing is any questions that I can answer. We'll keep this for like, I don't know, five minutes and then we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, call it a day on this. Oh man. So leave a fed, leave them dead. Oh my gosh. 
Bob Vester, thank you so much. Uh, looking for it. So yeah, Jenna uh, said, thank you so much, Zach. I look forward to the, this case study. Thank you. Um, um, insurance will pay. I have to be as smart as a PA is that. Oh, I'm not that smart, man. No, Zach, the only way we could save this guy was. <laughs> All right, Rob, take it easy. So this guy, Rob said we got to give him dopamine. Um, no, I don't give him dopamine. <laughs> dopamine is the devil's drug. Um, this was fun, especially when it's not real and when it's none of our fan. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this is this is. That's why I wanted to make sure that you guys know that these cases aren't real that we're talking about. They're 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 fabricated. We make them up, but we're doing them to learn a lot. So they're. They're really sick people that we're making up so that we can learn as much as we possibly can in the event that if this does happen in, in a patient that you see when you go out into clinical practice, you're prepared for the worst. Keep more cases, uh, Deeksha, um, we'll keep more cases coming. Very nice discussion. Thanks. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, we'll keep them coming. We'll have another one next week. I think it's going to be a really cool one as well. Is there any role for steroid use in this particular patient? Um, it depends on what you're using the steroids for. If you're using it for like a COPD exacerbation, sure, uh, that's not going to hurt them. Um, if you're using it for the cerebral edema, no, that's not great um, because vasogenic edema you could treat with uh, uh, steroids in someone who has like a brain abscess or they have a, a like a mass, like a tumor um, that's causing surrounding vasogenic edema. Steroids can help to re uh, uh, form that blood brain barrier uh, and stabilize those podocytes, but other than that, no, steroids aren't going to be great. I just have one question. If we were to give him any medications for the coagulopathy, would it increase his likelihood to obtain further? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. I think that's a really good question. Absolutely. That happens uh, most likely if you give this guy, if he had, let's say, atrial fibrillation and you gave him uh, PCC to try to make him less uh, likely to bleed, all right, okay, then you also, in a way, kind of make him slightly hypercoagulable. But in this kind of situation, we really need to try to control that bleed and prevent him from continuing to expand that bleed. So I think the PCC is warranted in this guy's case. Uh, what anticoagulant are preferred? Well, it depends on what you're anticoagulating him for. I wouldn't give him any anticoagulants um, in this scenario because it's going to worsen his bleed. Sure, steroids increase glucose patient already. Yeah, yeah, that's another thing. Good point. When someone you give someone steroids, um, it's going to increase their um, their glucose levels. Um, and so it's definitely going to cause hyperglycemia, which is going to require higher doses of insulin. Yep. So the neurological exam was because of the effect of vegetations that travel to the brain. Could have been, yeah, or could be the coagulopathy. Either way, he bled into that left uh, temporal, uh, so frontal parietal ICH. So he's going to develop. Uh, more of his symptoms are going to be worse on the right side, um, but uh, he also had compression of the brainstem on that left side. There's a lot of things going on with that guy. What caused the infective endocarditis? Yeah, drug abuse. Um, I'm sort of new to all this, but if you are trying to reduce cerebral edema, but then you have to give fluid for hypotension, is it sort of counterproductive to reducing cerebral edema? Uh, no, so if you're giving fluid like normal saline or lactated ringers, that's going to have sodium in it anyway. Um, so you're going to make the blood salty generally. Uh, sepsis and possible adrenal insufficiency could be um, I didn't check in this case I didn't put in there if there was any um, uh, cortisol levels or um, any ACTH levels in, in, in this kind of scenario let's just say that he was controlled um, that we'll make it up but we'll say that he was controlled on levofed and phenylephrine he didn't require extra vasopressors sometimes when people are maxed on vasopressors they're still not holding their maps you can suspect adrenal insufficiency and give them a a, 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 a steroid kind of uh, dose um, in that kind of situation. What's your favorite fluid for resuscitation? It depends. Um, in this guy's case, he needs probably lots of salt, so I'll give normal saline, the 3% hypertonic saline, just because we got to make him salty. Right? We want to try to dehydrate that brain. But generally, I prefer lactated ringer and any other scenario just because a lot of chloride can really be um, damaging to the kidneys um, and cause um, AKIs as well. <laughs> what did that man have? Multiple conditions. Ain't that right? All righty. Well, Ninja Nerds, I think that covers it for today. Um, I hope that you guys liked this video. I hope that you guys learned a lot from it, enjoyed it. It was fun. 